so let's get started. First, uh, some logistics. So homework three is due tonight, uh, and that's the last homework assignment beyond your, uh, your projects. And the project milestone, the first milestone, um, or the only milestone is due next Wednesday. Um, and then after that, uh, uh, you will, um, you'll just have the, the poster session and the final um, presentation or the final uh, report. Uh, we'll be sending out feedback on your project proposals within the next few days. Great, so uh, let's go through the plan for today. So uh, today we're gonna be talking about model-based reinforcement learning um, and how it can be used for multitask learning and meta-learning and also how it contrasts with model-free learning, which is the kind of reinforcement learning that we've been talking about thus far in the course. Um, we'll also be talking about how we can extend model-based reinforcement learning to image observations or other high-dimensional inputs. Uh, this is one of a, a very challenging use case for, for uh, model-based reinforcement learning, and so we'll, um, we'll be covering that in, uh, in more detail. And then we'll be also talking about model-based meta-reinforcement learning um, and settings where that might be applicable. Uh, and also just kind of by the end of this lecture, some of the things that you'll hopefully be able to learn about are uh, how to understand and use uh, and implement model-based reinforcement learning methods, uh, challenges and strategies for model-based reinforcement learning with high-dimensional inputs, and also um, how this relates to multitask learning and meta-learning. Okay, so first let's talk about uh, reinforcement learning algorithms from a, a broader view. Uh, so in previous lectures, we showed this diagram where we looked at reinforcement learning as an algorithm that uh, iterates between generating samples, fitting a model to estimate the return from those samples, and then using that to improve the policy. And we talked about Q-learning based methods and policy gradient based methods uh, that correspond to estimating the return uh, or fitting a Q function. Uh, and in contrast, model based approaches try to fit a model of the dynamics. Uh, and then each of these approaches improve the policy by either applying the policy gradient, uh, by taking uh, a max over your Q function in order to improve your policy, um, or to optimize actions or optimize the parameters of your policy using your model. So previous lectures we focused on model-free methods like policy gradients and Q-learning, uh, and this lecture will be focusing on what's known as model-based methods. Uh, and they're known as model-based methods because you're trying to fit this model of the what's known as the dynamics model. Okay. Um, so the main idea of model-based reinforcement learning is to learn a model of the environment. Uh, and you might wonder, okay, why do we want to do this? The previous reinforcement learning methods seem to work pretty well too, or, or maybe they don't, uh, depending on, on what you found in your project or, or, or in your homework. Um, and there's kind of two main reasons, I think, um, at least from what I've seen uh, in terms of uh, my own uh, experiments, is that model-based reinforcement learning tends to lead to better sample efficiency. So if you care about uh, learning with not a lot of interactions in the environment, fitting a model of the environment and then using that model to uh, optimize your policy can reduce the amount of data that you need in the environment. Um, this isn't true in all cases, uh, but it's true. It has at least been empirically true in a number of uh, different works. And also the model can be reused uh, for different tasks and different objectives. Uh, and we'll talk a bit about what that means later in the lecture. Um, and so uh, at a high level, what, this, what these algorithms type, uh, are trying to do is they're trying to estimate uh, a model of the dynamics. Uh, and this just corresponds to a supervised learning problem where you want to maximize the likelihood of the next state given the current state and the current action for all of the transitions in your buffer of data. Um, so for example, you could treat this uh, if, if you have continuous states uh, and you want to model the likelihood using a Gaussian, uh, you could just use the, the following optimization problem where you want to be able to uh, minimize the squared error between the predictions from your model and the observed next state. And this would be an example of a deterministic model. You could also Im imagine using uh, probabilistic or stochastic models as well that actually try to model that, that likelihood, um, model the full distribution of the likelihood. Okay, um, and so this is kind of the, uh, there's different ways, different model classes that you can use and different, uh, different ways that you can go about maximizing that likelihood, but it typically just amounts to a supervised learning problem. Um, and then once we have our model, we use that to improve our policy. Um, and I'll talk a bit about the different ways that we can do that in a minute. 
Um, and then you can use that policy or use the actions that you optimized to generate samples uh, and repeat this process. Okay, so now what does this have to do with multitask learning and meta-learning? So um, let's go back to our notion of what a reinforcement learning task is. Uh, and in particular, we considered um, this reinforcement learning task as basically an MDP, where different tasks ha may have different state spaces, different action spaces, different initial state distributions, dynamics, and rewards. Um, essentially, these, these tasks correspond to MDPs. Um, and one kind of observation is that in many practical scenarios that we might care about uh, in multitask reinforcement learning and in meta reinforcement learning, uh, it may be that the dynamics don't actually vary across tasks. Uh, that there's basically one single dynamics model that governs the, uh, governs the world that your agent is living in. Uh, and if this is true, then we may be able to uh, kind of exploit that property. Uh, so for example, uh, in the real world, if your agent is manipulating objects, or if it is uh, uh, walking around on the ground, or if it is navigating um, in an environment, the dynamics of the world, of the underlying world, for manipulating different, ob um, for doing different things with different objects, for getting to somewhere in the environment through locomotion or through navigation, in all these settings, the underlying dynamics of the world isn't necessarily changing. Um, of course, when the environment is fully observed. If you can't fully observe uh, phys physical information about the objects or about locomotion, uh, then there may be some variation across, uh, across tasks or across objects. Um, another example of this is character animation. So if you want to animate a character to do things like uh, spin, clicks, uh, spin kicks or cartwheels or, or, or running or backflipping, uh, all of these, th this agent lives in a single world with consistent dynamics. And what's varying is just the reward function and not the dynamics. Uh, and likewise, if you uh, have an agent that wants to uh, converse uh, and accomplish a certain task through dialogue, uh, such as helping you um, order dinner, for example, or helping you um, reserve a, a car reservation or something, uh, the underlying dynamics of, of interacting with that person may be the same, but the reward function of what you want to accomplish is varying. Uh, so here are a few examples of where the dynamics might be consistent across tasks. Uh, in all of these cases, Estimating the model is a single task problem. If there's just a single model, we only need to estimate a single function. And so as a result, then this learning problem may actually be easier than uh, some of the multitask model free methods because we only have to solve the single task learning problem. And then once we solve that single task learning problem, um, we can use that to uh, find a policy that optimizes uh, different tasks. Any questions on, on this? Okay, so um, how do we actually go about using our model to optimize for actions? So uh, we, we want to be able to kind of optimize actions using the model and, and our objective might be to maximize our reward summed over time. Uh, and so one way that we might think about doing this is uh, we can view this, this form of computation graph where we have actions being passed into our model. Our model is predicting the next state, um, which is uh, producing the reward function and also producing, uh, sorry, it, the model is estimating uh, the reward function and may also be estimating the next state, which is then passed to our policy to produce the next action and the next um, reward function. And so if we want to optimize over the sequence of actions that uh, maximize our reward, uh, we could imagine just back propagating the signal from our reward function into our actions through this computation graph. Uh, and so for example, we could use a gradient-based optimization over our actions to optimize for our actions. Uh, so what this might look like is uh, you might run some policy, for example, a random policy, uh, collect some data using that policy, and then fit a model to that data to minimize the, uh, the prediction error of that model and then backpropagate through that model in order to optimize for a sequence of actions. Uh, and then once you have those actions, you can just execute those actions uh, to accomplish the task that you'd like to perform. Uh, so this is pretty straightforward. Uh, another way that we could do this is say, say we don't want to use uh, backpropagation. Um, for example, maybe the model that we learn uh, is, doesn't have well-conditioned gradients, uh, or maybe uh, it's uh, discontinuous in some way. We can also optimize over actions via sampling. Uh, and this would be essentially a gradient-free optimization 
over our actions. Same, still the same underlying loss function, the same underlying optimization. We can just use a different optimization approach for acquiring a sequence of actions that will maximize reward. Uh, and so what this might look like is to run some policy, learn a model to minimize model error, uh, and then iteratively sample action sequences, run those action sequences through our model, uh, and the action sequence we find that achieves the best reward, we will then execute those corresponding actions. Uh, and there are ways to, um, to sample action sequences uh, in a more intelligent way. So you could imagine just sampling from some uniform distribution over action sequences and then taking the best one. Uh, but you could also imagine after sampling from a uniform distribution, you could take the best 10%, uh, for example, rather than the best one, and then refit a distribution around those, 10, around those top 10% of actions and resample from that distribution uh, and do this sort of iterative process to iteratively refine the sampling distribution over actions. Uh, that would be known as uh, something like the cross-entropy method, uh, and that would allow you to perform a slightly better optimization or a slightly better, um, slightly more powerful optimization over your actions. Okay, so here are a couple different um, approaches. What's something that might go wrong with these approaches? Any thoughts on that? Sparse reward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if your reward function is sparse and your optimization process isn't able to sample action sequences that lead to that reward, or let that actually see any reward, then it may be that uh, your optimization won't be powerful enough to actually uh, find a good sequence of actions. So that's one good example. What's another good example? Yeah. So in the previous example, you usually found like an optimization problem to get one single action. Yeah, so in both of these cases, you need to solve an optimization problem in order to get a sequence of actions that will, uh, that will try to maximize that reward. Sorry, can you repeat that? If there are inaccuracies in the model and you throw it forward or it's pan forward or some inaccuracies come down and you deviate way, way from like what the real equivalent of that actually is. Yeah, absolutely. So if your model, I guess there's, I think there's two things here. One is if your model is inaccurate, then the optimization can exploit that and, uh, and be overly optimistic about whether or not an action sequence will accomplish high reward. And the second thing is that uh, if you're optimizing for an open loop sequence of actions and then executing that sequence of actions, if one of those actions uh, reaches a state that's slightly different from what you thought you would reach, and then at the next state you execute another action, you'll have these compounding errors such that you move away from the trajectory that you, um, that you thought you were going to follow according to your model. Okay, any other thoughts on what might go wrong? Okay, cool. So the approach that, um, that I had written here was, I guess there's a couple, couple different things that we, we, di we discussed. Uh, the first is that you'll, you can potentially have uh, imprecisions in your model uh, and that will cause you to, um, to kind of be overly optimistic about what will happen. And second, that these errors can compound and cause you to kind of go off track um, and have increasing amounts of errors as you roll out your, um, as you roll out your uh, sequence of actions. One thing that will help with this, uh, actually, do any of you have thoughts on like how we might try to avoid some of these issues or, or these two issues in particular? Yeah. I have a question. Intuitively, it makes sense why this is bad, but on a theoretical standpoint, isn't this like minimizing regret by going with the most optimistic possible choice and then negating that if that turned out to not be true? Yeah, so the, the key thing is the second part that you said is that if that turned out not to be true, we need to actually take that into account, right? And so in the algorithm that I listed on the previous slide, we we're actually just fitting a model to our data and then executing actions according to that data. But if, we turn out, if it turns out that we take those actions and it was actually not the correct thing to do, as you're mentioning, then we should basically refit our model using the new data and use that to uh, continuously improve our model in the settings where we are overly optimistic. And so what you can do is you can go back to this previous algorithm and then actually execute those planned actions in the world, append the data that you observed to your data set and use that to refit your model um, to this uh, growing data set. Does that answer your question? I guess it seems like the answer is like that's not really that bad is what you're saying? Um, 
The, sorry, you're asking the... Um, like making an overly optimistic decision, we can just use that to our advantage through this. So, if you make an overly optimistic decision, it can certainly, if that is like, if you're, if you're like done running learning and you're not going to actually collect many more data, then it can be very bad because you'll just, you won't actually be making predictions that maximize reward. Uh, it can be arbitrarily bad if, if it's like erroneous outside of the, the states that you visited. Um, but if you have the ability to collect more data, then you in principle should be able to correct for those errors. Okay, so this is, uh, this is one thing that we can do. Um, but still, uh, even if, so this will help certainly, uh, it doesn't completely solve the problem. So in general, learning a good global model is pretty hard, uh, especially if you want to learn a good global model everywhere uh, in your, in, in all possible states, for example. Um, another trick that can be helpful with this is uh, what's called replanning. So, uh, and this is, uh, a fancier name for this is uh, model predictive control, or MPC. And what we can do is we can first run our, our policy to collect some data, fit a model to that data, use this model to optimize over our action sequence. And what we can do is we can execute the first planned action, observe the resulting state, um, append this to our data set, uh, and then after we take one, one action, we can then actually replan and re-optimize over a sequence of actions from the state that we just observed. And so what this can do is that if you end up at a state that you didn't expect uh, for, as a result of your model, you won't keep on executing actions as if you were in the state that you thought you would reach. You'll then actually replan according to the state that you actually reached uh, to tr try to correct for your mistake at that first time step. And so this can help address some of the compounding errors that we talked about before. Yeah? Would it be the same data set or would it be a different like, meta data set? Um, Yeah, so we haven't gotten to the meta-learning setting yet, but you could also imagine, so in this setting, uh, there might be a loop here, which is to kind of refit your model in this like slower outer loop. Um, in here, all, the only thing that you're doing is you're um, observing the state and then using your model to replan, to like re-optimize action sequences from that state. You're not actually, so you're using that to update your actions, you're not actually using it to update your model. And you could also imagine using that state to update your model. Uh, and we'll get to that actually at the, like towards the end of the lecture. Um, so you're a few steps ahead. Um, so intuitively this can help with model errors because it can, a lot, if you kind of go off track of where, where your model thinks you will end up, uh, you can in principle start to correct for those. Um, so the, the benefit of this is you can correct some model errors. One of the downsides of this approach, which I think was maybe alluded to uh, in one of the other questions, is that this is, in general, planning for actions is a fairly compute intensive process uh, because you need to continuously, I mean, if you're planning at every single time step, you're doing an optimization, you need to do an optimization in real time. Um, one thing that can help with this uh, is to optimize over, um, instead of optimize over a sequence of actions, you could actually back propagate actions into your policy. So if you have a parametric form of your policy, instead of back propagating gra gradients into the action, you can back propagate gradients into the policy parameters. Um, likewise, for a sampling based approach, if you optimize for a sequence of actions, you could use those as targets to train a policy to produce those actions. Um, and that can reduce some of the compute intensive challenges of things like MPC. Um, now, I also want to get back to the problem of sparse rewards that was mentioned. Um, learning a policy can also help with sparse rewards uh, in that if you, um, in aggregate at some point you see a good reward function or, or a good reward, then your policy, um, the policy parameters will be trained to try to uh, accomplish those. Um, in practice, like with very sparse rewards, model-based optimization and model-free optimization will run into the same sorts of issues if they don't actually ever observe rewards. Um, and things like relabeling, uh, as you saw in the pro uh, problem assignment can also help with that. Okay. Um, any questions on kind of the basic algorithms before we talk about the multitask setting? Yeah. My understanding is that like people who are more advocates of model free say that model free sometimes allows behaviors to emerge that wouldn't have been possible if model based. 
space, but the way that you presented it here, I, where where does that fall apart for model based, such that you can't get everything that you have as model free? So I actually haven't heard that argument before. Um, so the argument you said is that there are behaviors that will emerge with model free that you won't be able to have emerge with a model based method. Yeah, you're essentially like confining yourself too much and confining the agent too much by using model based methods. Yeah. I don't actually see why that would be the case. Like uh, in both cases, you are um, you're optimizing some objective, which is to maximize reward, and the behavior that emerges. Like like in both cases, you are going to be learning some behavior to maximize that reward function. And I think that what comes out of that optimization is more a function of the the power how powerful that optimization process is. Uh, and if it's if you have a very strong optimization process, then uh, more interesting, uh, well, and a reward function that's interesting, then more interesting behaviors will emerge. Uh, and I don't think that there's any difference. Um, I think that like any difference that you see in the outcome of these mo of these approaches will more have to do with the strength of the optimization and also how hard it is to fit the model versus fitting a policy. Um, there are definitely settings where it's harder to fit the model than to fit the policy. Uh, so, for example, if you want to pour water from one container to another container, modeling fluid dynamics is a hard problem, uh, but just twisting your arm is a relatively simple function to learn. Uh, in those settings, a model-free approach uh, may be easier. In other settings, uh, such as if you want to be able to um, push an object to any possible position, uh, the dynamics may be relatively simple because it just corresponds to one object on, on the table and the, the dynamics there. Uh, whereas the policy may be more complex because for any pos you have to represent the policy for any possible goal, um, whereas the dynamics are just is just a single task problem. Okay, so we can look at um, what does this actually look like? And we use this question about like what does this have to do with multitask RL and, and meta RL? So. Um, how you actually apply this to the multitask RL and meta RL problem statement depends on whether or not you know the reward function. Um, and in particular, there are some instances where you actually know the form of the reward function uh, exactly. Uh, so um, we'll see an example of this in a second. And if you know the reward function for each task, uh, then you could just learn a single model and plan with respect to that reward function at each um, at test time. Uh, so, for example, um, here's an example of uh, a work that was done by Anusha Nagabandi and colleagues. And what they were looking at is uh, they wanted to, to learn how to write different trajectories with a pen. And they were controlling the, uh, the hand uh, in simulation. And different reward functions correspond to different trajectories of the tip of the pencil. And so, in this case, they assumed that they could observe the tip of the pencil. And then the reward function can be derived as just trying to track a particular trajectory with the tip of the pencil. So the form of the reward function is known, uh, but optimizing that, uh, the reward function uh, by actually using the hand to draw is a very challenging problem. And so they learned a model, um, and they actually learned a model by collecting data with respect to random trajectories. And then at test time, they gave it reward functions for writing different digits. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see. I think the first digit is a six, the second one is a seven, the next one is like a nine or a four, and the last one is a five. Uh, and you can basically use that model to plan to accomplish these different, um, these different trajectories. Um, another example of this is uh, maybe uh, you want the hand to be able to manipulate uh, these bounding balls, like uh, move them in a circle, for example. Here, the reward function is also known. It corresponds to the trajectory of the, of the two balls. Uh, and you can also have a reward function corresponding to moving a, uh, the ball to a particular location in the, in the palm, or also um, rotating the balls in the opposite direction. Cool. So here, here's an example of kind of multitask reinforcement learning with a single model and different reward functions. Um, one caveat that I'd like to mention here is that uh, even though the, the dynamics may be consistent across all of the tasks, different tasks may require you to visit different state distributions. And so if you collect data for one task, and another task is a very different state distribution, then the model that you learn for that one task may not actually generalize to the second task if it doesn't visit the, uh, the same states. Um, so the reward may change how you collect the data and may affect the quality of your model in other states. Um, in this work, they found that if you actually train a model only on this first task, 
uh, that model can actually be reused for these second two tasks because the distribution over states is sufficiently diverse. Um, in this case, the state representation corresponds to the position of the two balls and the um, state information about the hand, such as the joint angles. Um, I'm not, I'm actually thinking about this more, a bit more. I'm not quite sure how they go from two balls to one ball, because the state representation changes in that case. Um, I would guess that maybe they just use the, the model corresponding to uh, one of the balls and they ignore the second one. Um, but I, I'd have to check the details of the paper for that. It's possible that they're different sizes. I, my impression was that they were um, the same size and maybe the, the videos, actually, so the hand is also bigger in the left video. So I think it's just that this, the video has been scaled differently. Um, another cool thing about this approach is that uh, because it's able to learn a model um, pretty quickly with a relatively small amount of data, they actually were able to run this method on a real robot uh, and actually run the reinforcement learning process and collect all of the data on a real robot and fit a model to that. Um, and we're able to get a, uh, a real shadow hand to perform this task. Cool. Yeah. Um, it's actually pretty recent work. Well, so I, I'm, I know Anusha well, so I've, I've seen it for a while, but uh, I think that the video came out like within the last month. Um, it was published at Coral, which was last week, which is why I was actually not here. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. So that's what happens if we know the reward function. Uh, what if we don't know the reward function, or the, at least the form of the reward function? Um, one thing we can do is we can just learn a reward function uh, conditioned on the task, and then use that reward function to plan to accomplish tasks. Uh, and I have a typo on the next thing, but uh, this should say meta RL. Um, the other thing that you could do is you could meta learn a reward function from a small amount of data and use that to use that learned reward function to plan to accomplish goals. Um, so this is pretty straightforward. Uh, one example of the second case um, is some work here where the, the training data set corresponds to a few examples of the goal. Uh, so in this case, the goal is to uh, place the, the pencil case to, on top of the, uh, or behind the notebook. And given a few positive examples, you want to be able to learn a classifier or a binary reward function that corresponds to whether or not the task has been accomplished in the image. Um, and so you can, you can do this task with meta-learning by, by, by meta, meta learning by collecting a data set of a bunch of positive and negative examples for different tasks. Meta-learn your uh, classifier such that given a small number of positive examples, it can quickly learn a new reward function. And then once you have that reward function, you can plan using your model to maximize reward. Um, so here's the kind of the result of running uh, planning and then executing those actions on the robot uh, to accomplish the task with respect to this uh, meta-learned reward function. Okay. Um, and I guess kind of the, the bigger takeaway here is that uh, model-based RL solves both the multitask RL problem and the meta RL problem statements with these, uh, with these different types of approaches, depending on whether or not you have the reward function or not. Okay. Any questions before we move on to image observations? So one thing worth mentioning here that I didn't actually tell you is that this is, this is all from images. Uh, and so how do we actually go about doing model-based RL when we have image observations, right? Um, so uh, in particular, uh, if you only have access to images, you might have uh, a graphical model like this where you can actually observe the underlying state, uh, the low dimensional underlying state of the world and you can only observe the O's shown here. Uh, so for example, maybe uh, you have a robot that looks like this and you want it to be able to uh, use the spatula to lift up an object and put it into the bowl. And all it can observe is this image. Um, so first, uh, with, with these images, we have to deal with learning models uh, in, in, in some space, at least in learning how to predict. Uh, and second, we also don't have any reward function necessarily if we only have those observations. And so we need to think about how we might go about learning a reward function, um, such as using the meta-learning approach that I showed on the previous slide. 
Okay, so one option uh, for the reward function is to learn an image classifier, like I showed before, or to meta-learn an image classifier. Um, another example or another option is to provide an image of the goal. Uh, and this would co correspond to the goal conditioned reinforcement learning setting uh, that we have covered previously and that you looked at in your homework. And so for example, you could give the, uh, the robot an image of the goal like this, uh, saying I want you to, to accomplish this, uh, this goal state uh, and have it try to, to reach that goal state. Um, so how might we go about doing model-based RL in this setting? So there's a few different classes of approaches that we'll cover. Um, the first is to learn some latent representation and then learn a model in that latent representation. The second is to try to learn a model of your observations directly. Uh, and the last one is to try to predict alternative quantities other than your raw observations. And we'll talk about all three of these approaches. Uh, so first let's talk about latent space. So uh, the key idea of learning in a latent space is that you want to learn just some embedding of your observation, which we'll, use, we'll denote as G of O, and then learn a model inside that embedding space. Uh, so if we take the graphical model that we showed before, this corresponds to trying to uh, learn some form of inference network that maps from your observations to your, uh, back to your low dimensional states, or back to some representation of your state space. Um, so then, uh, Kind of the way this works, I guess, is uh, first there's a couple papers that have looked at this kind of approach um, shown here that we'll talk about. And there, more recently, there are a couple of other approaches that have looked at this kind of approach as well. So um, the way this algorithm works is first you run some policy to collect some data. Uh, then you learn this latent space of your observation and um, a model in that latent space. So you learn a G to go from O to S and then you learn a model that goes from S and A to predict S prime. Then you use your model to optimize over a sequence of actions, uh, and then execute those planned, act, uh, planned actions, uh, append the visiting tuples. Uh, in this case, it may be the, the state and action and next state, or it might be the observation, the action and the next observation. Um, and then you can add those uh, tuples and then re, um, retrain your embedding space and retrain your, uh, your model. Okay, so this is pretty straightforward. Uh, there are a couple questions though. Um, the first question is what is your reward function when you're trying to optimize over your actions? Uh, so we talked a little bit about how your reward function could correspond to a classifier. Um, in the case where you're given an image of the goal, one thing you can do is you can use your reward signal as um, some reward signal of your actions, such as trying to minimize effort or torque, uh, plus a distance function, and that sh there should be a negative sign in front of that, some distance, some negative distance between uh, the goal of your current observation and, sorry, the, the representation of your current observation and the representation of your goal observation. So you can basically use the negative distance in your latent space as a reward function for planning. Okay, um, and this makes the assumption that distance, distance in your latent space is an accurate metric for the things that you care about. Uh, and this, this assumption may or may not be true depending on the form of your latent representation. Okay, and then the second big question or maybe kind of the most salient question is how do you actually get this latent representation space? Um, <clears throat> there's a couple of different approaches that people have taken to try to do this. Um, one of the more popular approaches uh, that was looked at in 2015 and also actually more recently is to try to uh, form a graphical model of your transitions. Uh, and this basically corresponds to a variational autoencoder that looks at transitions over pairs of states rather than a single variational autoencoder for a single state. Uh, and then as a result, what you get is you're optimizing jointly for the latent representation uh, of your variational autoencoder, for example, as well as the transition uh, distribution, your, your model in that latent space. Uh, and so if you do this, you can uh, kind of get, an, get a representation space that is good, uh, both, uh, that is both low dimensional as well as uh, satisfies your model effectively. Uh, and so for example, they showed that uh, you could use this, uh, use the, the algorithm with this latent space for accomplishing different kinds of goals. So um, the goal image was shown on at the beginning of the video, and then in each case it's trying to reach, it's executing actions that try to reach that image. Um, so we'll see another example in a minute. 
So here the goal state is to uh, curl up the arm and the left is showing the executed actions and the right is showing the one step predictions of the reconstructed image through that generative model. Um, and so one of the things that you can see is that it can uh, use a single model and a certain, a single latent representation to accomplish these different goals. Um, the other thing worth mentioning is uh, kind of, I alluded to at the beginning of this lecture that the model-based methods tend to be fairly efficient. Um, this approach required about 300 trials to learn uh, these, these skills from the pixel representations, which if you were to run that in the real world would probably correspond to about 25 minutes of real time which is pretty fast as reinforcement learning goes. Um, in practice, some of the more recent model-free methods take around uh, two to three hours to learn. Yeah? If I remember correctly, that paper uh, that you control, and I'm guessing you're also referring to Solar as the more recent work? Um, there are a couple more recent works. Solar is one of them. There's also um, Stochastic Latent and Dr. Critic, which is covered um, more recently. That one's kind of more of a hybrid method, but also has this form of graphical model. Yeah. And that's what makes learning fast because you can just directly use those dark controllers or whatever. Yeah. Do you think that's general enough for like more diverse tasks? Yeah, so the question is this method and some of the, the predecessors uh, or successors of this method um, place this assumption on the latent space, which is that you can linearly, or you can basically have a local linear model on that space that can accurately predict the next state given the current state. Um, where local means that you may have a time varying linear model. Uh, I think that theoretically speaking, if you have a universal function approximator that's producing your state, it seems like it should, it should be possible to learn a latent space that is, that does actually satisfy that constraint. Um, in practice, it may be, that may be a very difficult optimization problem to actually find that, that latent space. And we haven't yet seen these kinds of methods perform well on very diverse settings where you have um, many different objects in the scene and, and, and uh, kind of the kind of diversity and complexity that you see in like natural images and, and, in, um, and in like image and images, for example. Uh, that is actually, I'll, I'll come back to that point in a second as well um, as we talk about kind of modeling in latent space versus modeling in observation space. Yeah. Are you familiar with Planet? Yes. Planet? Planet is also learning uh, a, a latent representation and doing planning in that representation. The planning approach that they use, um, I can't remember the, the exact details of which planning approach they use. I think it actually may have corresponded to a model-free algorithm. Um, sorry, what? Oh, okay, right, okay, yeah. So it was using, right, okay. So it was using cross-entropy method, um, which is the, basically the iterative sampling-based approach that we talked about. Um, Planet, uh, Planet is also kind of has a very similar form of this graphical model, although in addition to having the stochastic pathway, they also had a deterministic pathway in their model. Um, the Planet, to my knowledge, wasn't tested in the multitask case. Uh, it was just tested in the single task case, but in principle, the, the model that's learned could also be used in the multitask setting. Yeah, so there's been a number of approaches recently that have kind of followed this form of kind of learning a latent space with some sort of probabilistic or semi-probabilistic approach and then doing learning in that latent space. Um, one other example of um, a latent space that, uh, that we used in 2016 and also was actually has been studied a bit more recently as well is having representations that are, have structure to them. Um, so in this case, the structure that we were looking at were latent spaces where the, um, the, the dimensions of the latent space correspond to key points in the image. Uh, so for example, here are two example, um, two example key points that are in the representation, and this is the trajectory that that, that representation follows as the robot executes the trajectory. Um, and this, more recently, there's been a kind of a trend of approaches that try to learn object-centric representations or, or key point-based representations uh, of images and then perform planning or perform model-based RL in the context of those representations. Um, and so this is kind of maybe an alternative view. I think that both of them have their merits. Uh, and 
I guess specifically for, for this, this approach, the way that you actually try to get those feature points um, is you, take, you can take the last convolutional layer of your network, perform a softmax over the spatial extent of the image to get a distribution over 2D positions in the image. And then once you have a, uh, all these distributions over key points, you can then, uh, th here's an example of the softmax where the softmax is over the X position and the Y position. Um, then you can take an expectation where you compute the, uh, an expectation over that 2D distribution to get the XY coordinate of the, um, of the, of approximately the, the key point of maximal activation. Um, so you can essentially view this as a form of like spatial softmax. Uh, so instead of doing a softmax over a one dimensional operation, you can do a softmax over a 2D space uh, and get some uh, key point out of it. Uh, and of course, I guess the, the important part is that this operation is actually fully differentiable. So you can uh, optimize for these kinds of representations um, with respect to the, um, the objective that you care about, be it things like reconstruction or something like the objective of your task. Uh, and there are also other kind of uh, more recent approaches that have looked at um, kind of other, other ways of getting like these key point like representations or object centric representations uh, in unsupervised ways or in like weekly supervised ways. Um, and so when the, the result that you get out of this is if you train it to uh, do reconstruction, here are two of the feature points that you might get out of it, um, out of the, in this case, the 16 feature points that were used. Okay, um, and I guess there was also, I said smooth here because there's also an auxiliary loss to encourage these representations to be, to have um, similar, to have constant velocity uh, through time. Um, but I think that that detail is maybe a little bit less important. Yeah. Yeah, so in this case, the number of feature points, to the number of total feature points need to be pre predefined um, as part of your network, network architecture. So in this case, the number of feature points is, is 16, um, and the dimensionality is 16 times two. Uh, one thing you could imagine doing uh, that we actually did explore in this paper as well is have a larger number of feature points and then prune the feature points according to some metric. Uh, for example, according to, um, if some feature points you observe to be very noisy, uh, then you could prune those feature points out if you don't think that they correspond to, in an automatic way, if you don't think they correspond to um, things relevant to the task. Yeah? So in this case, it was a completely unsupervised um, setting. So the, uh, the goal, this autoencoder was, uh, it's, it's an autoencoder, so it was, is, is, its loss is to reconstruct the image. It needs to find these 2D key points that allow it to reconstruct the image. Um, and because different images have different positions of objects, then uh, extracting the positions of objects, or actually extracting the positions of things that change and move in the image, lead to um, good reconstructions. So it's essentially just a constraint on your latent space to have, to, to have it be representing these 2D positions, um, and how it uses that, that representation space is up to the model. Yeah, so uh, occlusions is challenging. Uh, one thing you could imagine doing is having a recurrent model, uh, and then the recurrent model in principle could try to track it. Um, in this work, one of the things we did to deal with occlusions was we used a filtering-based approach. Um, we basically did a form of filtering where you can basically look at that, the softmax distribution if it's very peaked then it's likely that the, the point is in view. If it's not peaked, then it's likely that the point is occluded. And if it is occluded, then you can actually use your model to fill in uh, like a common filter style update to fill in where you think that point is. Yeah, so there's a lot of potential details here that I wasn't planning to cover, but it's, yeah, there's different things that you can imagine doing. Um, another challenge with this type of approach like that I guess is worth mentioning is that if you have two objects that are identical, um, this softmax, since it's over the entire extent of the image, it's going to have two peaks uh, if they look identical. And therefore, if you take the expectation, then you'll either get the average, you'll get, you'll get, you'll get the point that dominates, um, or you might get this flickering between the two points. And so there isn't uh, necessarily a satisfying way to deal with that. Yeah. Is there a paper reference, or is this pretty new? Uh, this is actually from 2016. Oh. So the paper reference is there. 
Um, so here's an example of the learning process. So uh, we actually, in this work, we gave it both the goal image as well as the goal position of the arm. We initialized it with a policy that could, move, that could reach the, position, the goal position of the arm, but not the goal image. Uh, and then this is the course of uh, model-based reinforcement learning, where in this case, it's actually optimizing for a policy that tries to reach both the goal image and the goal position of the arm. Uh, and this is a toy task where the goal position, of the arm, the goal position is just a reach uh, to push the cube over to the left. Uh, and then the final policy you get looks something like this, where um, it's able to push it to the specified position on the, um, on the mat. The colors actually seem off. This is supposed to be green, but um, anyway. Uh, then you can also perform the task, the, the, the spatula task that I showed before, where the goal is to um, get the spatula to be in the bowl. Cool. Um, so one of the nice things about this approach also, w with these sorts of key point based representations, I don't, I guess I'm spending more time on the key point based representations, but I don't think there's necessarily one approach is necessarily better than the other. But one thing that is quite convenient about this is you can actually visualize the key points on the image. So in this case, the X's correspond to the goal position and the blue and the circles correspond to the current position of the key points. And you can, uh, with this ability to, to visualize them directly on the image, it makes for a very interpretable representation. Uh, and this is very useful for debugging uh, because if your representation isn't capturing and isn't tracking the objects that you care about, then it's likely that uh, your algorithm won't work because your representation isn't capturing those things. Yeah. So the key points are the latent state, right? Yes, the key points are the latent representation. Okay. Um, so these skills were learned with about 125 trials, which corresponds to about 11 minutes of robot time per task. Uh, in this case, the representation was actually learned uh, per environment or, or per task. Uh, so it's kind of learning this environment specific latent representation. Um, and so as a result, the representation is gonna be kind of somewhat specific to that environment. And so for example, if you took this, these representations and try to use it for a different task, like the Lego block task, they wouldn't necessarily track the objects uh, because they weren't trained on those images. Okay, cool. So one thought exercise. Uh, so both of the approaches that we looked at were autoencoder type approaches, like generative models, where we're predicting the, uh, the, uh, the image, we're trying to generate the image through some bottleneck. And we may also be learning a model on that bottleneck. So one question is, uh, why do we need to reconstruct the image, right? Uh, why not just learn some embedding space, like the feature points, and then also learn a model on those feature points and train the representation such that the model is accurate? This seems like somewhat of a reasonable approach. Uh, why is this maybe not a good approach? Uh, optimizing with respect to model error for the representation would actually, is actually definitely a solvable problem. Um, right, so the embedding does depend on the problem that you're solving. And so if you're optimizing with respect to model error, then it, uh, it may not capture, it'll capture things about the model and not necessarily about the task. Yeah? Um, if it's in the latent space, it might not capture some small deviation in the real image. Um, the model is accurate. Yeah, that's actually also a problem with, that, that, yeah, it's definitely a problem. It's also actually a problem with reconstruction based approaches. And we'll see that in a second. Yeah? So if you only have one model error, you cannot perfectly disentangle it for the embedding and the model. Mm -hmm. so and so what does that, what does that mean? So you're losing information if you're converting from the sum of those two to the model error. Mm -hmm. And so what happens if you optimize for both the embedding and the model with respect to the error of the model? It's imperfect is the same thing. Sorry, what? Would it be possible that embedding works the same thing and the model error will be zero too? Yes. Yeah. So there is a solution to this to this this but to basically to the model error objective, which is that if your embedding is always the same thing if it's a constant. Uh, if it's like always zero, for example, then it's perfectly, it's very easy to predict 
the next state, right? Because it's just always zero. Um, and then as a result, I mean, that embedding isn't very useful because it's a constant, it's always zero, uh, but it achieves perfect model error. Um, so there's basically this degenerate solution that comes up if you try to optimize with respect to model error um, with the, for both the embedding and the model. Um, so it's not really a, a good idea. <laughs> um, and so this is why we need kind of other, other forms of objectives to optimize for these representations in addition to model error so that you can avoid that degenerate solution. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, so that's actually uh, an interesting point. So if you add um, an entropy term, interestingly, that will actually correspond to maximizing the mutual information between your representation and your, uh, your observation. Um, so the, I don't, well, if you, uh, if you wanna maximize your mutual information between your image observation and your latent representation, uh, you can show that this is equal to uh, H of Z minus h of z given s. Uh, and so this would correspond to maximizing entropy, like you said, and this would correspond to um, being able to predict z from s. Uh, and so that's actually a pretty good thing to do, and a lot of people have looked at these types of objectives for learning representations. Cool. Um, so, to wrap up the latent space approaches, uh, the benefits of this approach is that you can learn pretty complex skills uh, very efficiently. And some structured, structured representations enable very effective learning of these tasks. Um, the downsides is that, uh, or I guess one of the main downsides is that we need good objectives for learning these representations. Um, and things like reconstruction objectives may not actually recover the right representation. Uh, so as an example of this, uh, when I was doing those experiments a few years ago with the, the spatula task, we also wanted the robot to do another task, which uh, was to manipulate a ping pong ball uh, by like, basically like, kind of transferring it from one container to another container. And so here's a downsampled image of, uh, of that experiment where the white dot corresponds to the ping pong ball and the, you can see the arm of the robot as well. And so I trained an autoencoder on these images and the reconstructions that I got out of it look like this. Uh, and so what you can see is that it learns to, uh, learns a very good eraser of the ping pong ball uh, and instead just learns to reconstruct the arm uh, because that's the thing that's larger in the image. And so there's this mismatch between the objective of the representation learning and the objective of the task that you might care about. Um, so kind of the takeaway here is that we may need better unsupervised representation learning methods, uh, be it reconstruction based methods or um, like mutual information based objectives. Okay, um, and then one other side note is that low dimensional embeddings can be also be very useful for model free approaches. Uh, so for example, you could learn a, a low dimensional embedding and do model free in that latent space, model free RL in that latent space. Uh, so there's work back in 2012 that did this for this, um, this slot car uh, where they trained an autoencoder and then to, down to a two dimensional representation and then did fitted Q iteration on top of that two dimensional representation. Uh, and this work actually predates things like DQN, so they're doing deep RL back in, back in 2012. Uh, here's an approach that was able to run TRPO, which is typically an algorithm that requires a very large number of samples, uh, but they learned a latent space of actually both the state and the actions, and were able to run TRPO on a real robot uh, to throw an object to hit the Pikachu. And then there are also methods that use an embedding for the reward function. So we talked a little bit about how uh, in the previous approaches we were using the, the embedding both for the state representation and for the reward representation. Um, in this case, this work was looking at uh, acquiring a reward function from ImageNet features. Uh, so this is actually a supervised representation learning method. They took, uh, they took a video of a human opening a door, ran that through ImageNet, and then used that as a reward function for a robot to try to reach the same features that the, uh, that the video on the left was, uh, was reaching. Um, and then one other thing worth mentioning is that you if you have a reward, you can actually predict it to form a better latent space. And this, can, this is one way to kind of help solve that degenerate solution, pro um, degenerate solution that we observed if you just try to predict model error. And there are a number of approaches that have looked into that as well. 
Um, one reason why you may not want to predict reward is that maybe that you don't have a good reward function. Um, so in the case of the spatula, in the case of the, um, the embedded control paper, if we just have goal images, we don't actually have reward functions. Um, but if you do have a reward function, it's, it's good to try to use it. Okay. Um, now that we've talked about latent space models, let's talk about modeling things directly in your observation space. Uh, so we can recall the um, kind of the model-based RL approaches that we mentioned before. Uh, in this case, this is just the, the same MPC algorithm that I showed before, but where all the states are replaced with our observations O. And what we can do is we can learn a model on our observations uh, and, and plan with that model. So uh, first we want to run some policy uh, to collect some data. Uh, so for example, we could collect data that looks like this. Um, this is just robots randomly interacting with with objects, picking them up and such. And then the data corresponds to the images and the actions. Uh, and so it's very easy to collect data like this. You don't need reward functions. You can just run, run off your, your robot or your agent in whatever environment. Uh, then you can learn a model to minimize prediction error. And so this corresponds to a video prediction model. So you may get predictions that look like this for different actions that are run through your model. Um, also, because we're, uh, we're not imposing any representation on our, uh, on our uh, state, we could also apply these sorts of models to deformable objects because we're just predicting our raw sensory observations. Uh, and then once we have that model, we can use that model to optimize over actions uh, by actually sampling trajectories to that model and picking the actions that we think will accomplish our goal. Uh, so this is pretty straightforward. Uh, there are a couple challenges, though, which is that we need to learn these models, which are pretty challenging to learn, and we need to be able to learn uh, models by optimizing through these large video prediction models. So uh, first question, how do we actually predict video? Um, we want to learn this model. Uh, this is a fairly complex model because it's a model of how images transform as a consequence of our actions. So. Uh, this is a problem that people have actually been studying for a little while now, uh, maybe five, 10 years uh, at least. Uh, although back in, in 2016, it turned out that the models were pretty bad. Uh, so uh, some, one of the, an example of a model that works uh, a bit better is something that looks like this. So this is just a big neural network. Um, the, kind of the, the main points is that it's, uh, it's deep neural network and it's recurrent. Uh, and each of these, uh, each of the yellow arrows corresponds to a recurrence, and each of the green boxes and blue boxes correspond to convolutions. Uh, it's performing multiple, multiple multi-frame predictions, so it's predicting multiple frames into the future. Uh, it's conditioning on actions, so the actions uh, are passed in here, as well as any state information that you might have about like the position of the robot's arm. Um, and then the other thing about this model is that it's actually explicitly modeling the motion of pixels. So um, rather than actually trying to generate pixels directly, like having the neural network output pixels, pixel values, uh, what this model is doing is that it's taking the previous image, it's predicting um, actually multiple convolution kernels, and then applying those convolution kernels to the image to generate multiple transformations of that image, and then composing those transformed images uh, with these also predicted masks into a single image prediction. Um, so it's essentially predicting the motion of, basically predicting how the previous image will transform into the next image in a way that's differentiable that can be back propagated through. Um, and so here are some examples of some videos from uh, a robot. And if you took uh, some of the models back in, uh, in 2015, for example, uh, you would get models that look like this, uh, or predictions that look like this, which don't look very good. Uh, whereas if you um, have recurrent models that are predicting multiple frames and are explicitly modeling motion, you get predictions that look uh, much cleaner, still blurrier. Uh, and in general, the video predictions that we're getting out of these models, uh, even uh, in, in 2019, uh, still leave some to be desired, but they're um, still things that we found can be useful for control. Yeah. Does this use model control as well? Yeah, so let's talk about the, um, let's talk about the planning approach. So once we have our model, we need to actually optimize an action sequence. So the way that you can do this is uh, 
basically with the sampling-based optimization that we described previously. So say this is our initial image. We would consider potential action sequences, it's probably like 100 or a couple hundred action sequences, uh, including these two action sequences. Then predict the future for each action sequence by running those actions through your model to get video predictions that look like this. Uh, and then you can pick the future that you like the best uh, and execute the corresponding action. Um, or instead of picking the best one, you could also iteratively resample and then pick the best one. Uh, and then what you do is you can actually repeat these first three steps in real time in order to replan and, and do MPC um, and basically do this planning at every single time step. Um, we found that this is something that is practical to do, but uh, in the context of, uh, with video prediction models, it can be a bit slow. So the sampling-based approach corresponds to rolling out these big convolutional neural networks uh, and rolling out batch, batches of like 100 or hundreds of action sequences. And so as a result, uh, the, the time it takes to plan can be on the order of one hert, for example, um, depending on how many GPUs you paralyze over. That one hert would probably be like paralyzed across like two to four GPUs. Okay, um, so you can essentially view this as MPC, but in visual space, uh, just like visual MPC. Okay, so that's kind of how you can do these sorts of model-based RL methods in the raw observation space. Uh, the way that it works um, at test time is you, can, you need to specify some goal. There are a few different ways that you can specify goals as we talked about before. You could learn an image classifier. You could, um, you could provide an image of the goal. Uh, one of the things that we did in some of this work is specify the goal by clicking on a pixel and clicking on where that pixel should be moved to. Uh, so for example, in this case, the goal would be to fold the left uh, pant leg of these shorts uh, by moving the red pixel to the green pixel. Uh, and then we also specify a, a, another pixel right here to specify that um, the pants should stay in place um, if, they're not, uh, if they're not part of the folding part. Um, so once you have this goal, you can run uh, MPC with respect to this specified goal. And then this is the video prediction corresponding to the action plan that was found by MPC. And then execute the corresponding action on the robot uh, to try to accomplish that goal. And so here's an example of uh, what the robot could try to accomplish by, uh, with, the, with respect to the goal of moving the pixel upward. Okay, um, and so getting back to the kind of multitask learning aspect of model-based RL, one of the things that you can do is you can use the single video prediction model to accomplish multiple tasks. So um, for example, if your goal is to pick up an object, you can click on an object, click on where you want it to move, and the robot can figure out how to pick it up. Um, also, if you want to manipulate the sleeve of a shirt, uh, it can figure that out, um, or like a task like putting an apple onto a plate. Uh, and then we can also look at a few other examples, like uh, folding the shorts, re like rearranging an object, or um, like covering an object with a towel. Um, yeah, so one of the nice things about this is that it allows us to accomplish many different goals or many different reward functions with a single model without having to retrain our model for every single task. Um, and the other nice thing about this is that the model training part is self-supervised. You don't need to provide reward functions or supervision. Um, the robot can kind of just collect data uh, and train the model on that data. Okay, so um, the benefits of this kind of approach is that uh, this was uh, able to scale to real images uh, fairly effectively. Um, there's also very limited human involvement, uh, so the model training was fully self-supervised. Uh, and this was also able to accomplish many different tasks with a single model. Um, these pros are also shared with many of the latent space approaches as well. Although in practice, we've found that latent space approaches uh, have trouble modeling some of, the some of the diversity of the videos like this, because you have to capture all of those objects that you might see in a compact latent space. Um, and some of the downsides is that despite the fact that they're real images, there's somewhat limited background variability. So this is more variability than like the spatula example, for example, but still less variability to things um, like ImageNet, for example. Um, you can't, ha can't yet handle as complex skills as the uh, spatula example, for example. These are just um, kind of pick and place style tasks. And it's also very compute intensive at test time. Okay, any questions on how that works?
Okay. Um, one other quick aside, since I think we have a bit of time, is uh, how can we think about actually doing more complex skills uh, rather than things like pick and place? And one thing you could imagine doing, uh, as we talked about before, is using your planner to collect more data and then using that data to improve your model. And I would expect something like that to uh, perform pretty well. Although in practice, one of the challenges with that is if your planner is very compute intensive, then it may be very expensive to collect more data using your model. Uh, so one approach that we've looked at in the context of this work uh, is if we can incorporate some forms of supervision, such as demonstrations, in order to learn more complex skills. So uh, what you could do is you could collect uh, demonstrations from many different tasks and potentially use those demonstrations to improve the complexity of skills that you could learn with this approach. Uh, in particular, there's a few different ways that you could use these demonstrations. Um, the first is to append it to your data set and use them to improve your model. Uh, but you can also use it to improve the other two uh, approaches as well. So what you could do is you could fit a model to the behavior of the demonstrator to basically predict the kinds of actions that the demonstrator might take based on an initial image. And if you have this model of the kinds of tasks that are interesting to perform, then you can use this to first direct your data collection pr process towards the more interesting kinds of behaviors and the more interesting tasks. And you can also use it to guide the planning process. Um, so if you know that you're going to be doing kind of a task that, is, uh, that may resemble some of the tasks that you saw in the demonstrations, then you can sample actions uh, similar to the actions that the human would, would take in addition to the actions uh, that you would sample from some random distribution. Uh, so an example of this is that, uh, I guess, one, one setting where we studied this problem is in the example where you want to have a robot manipulate tools. Uh, so here are some examples of the demonstrations that, uh, that the uh, user collected of using different tools to uh, push them in different ways. Uh, here are some examples of the samples from the action proposal model. So this is kind of the, uh, the types of actions that the robot thinks that the user might perform. So these correspond to kind of grasping towards objects and moving those objects. Uh, these these uh, actions are actually passed through the video prediction model. So these aren't actually videos, but these are actions that I think might be interesting uh, as passed through the video prediction model. And then what you can do is that uh, you can specify your goal as before, then run planning guided by that action proposal model with respect to your goal uh, to get a prediction that looks like this and a sequence of actions that, that corresponds to this video. And then execute those actions on the robot to get um, to try to accomplish the goal in the bottom, in the top left. Okay, so by actually incorporating these diverse demonstrations, we're allowed we're, uh, the robot is allowed is can now kind of perform these more complex tasks that involve grasping an object and then using that object to perform the task rather than just uh, pick and place tasks and pushing tasks. Okay, um, and again, because the the model is trained on a diverse set of uh, objects and tasks, and because the demonstrations are also diverse, it means that the single model is reusable for these different kinds of tasks. So um, the model can be used to solve uh, tasks that weren't seen in the demonstrations, such as uh, using a broom to push objects into a dustpan. Um, it can be used for trying to like use a hook to bring out of reach objects closer to the robot. Um, so in this case, the, the robot was constrained to move in that green shaded region, such that it actually had to use the hook in order to, to accomplish the task of moving the, the, um, the blue object closer. Um, it can also generalize to unseen tools, and this is uh, by nature of the fact that it has a, a large diverse data set. Um, also unseen tools that aren't really conventional tools, like water bottles. Um, and because you're sampling from both uh, the demonstration, the action proposal distribution, and the random distribution, uh, it can also figure out when to use a tool, such as when there are two objects that need to be pushed, versus when not to use a tool, um, when only a single object needs to be pushed. Okay, cool. So that was one aside on one way that you might go about incorporating demonstration data or incorporating other forms of supervision in order to perform more complex tasks. Um, the last kind of approach that I'd like to talk about with regard to image observations is predicting alternative quantities. So uh, it may be that you don't want to be reconstructing images. Uh, 
such as uh, video prediction models and autoencoders. And it may be that you have some supervision or some other auxiliary information that you care about for performing your task. And in these contexts, you can try to predict those sorts of things. Uh, so for example, if you want to be able to learn how to grasp objects, what you could do is that given a sequence of actions, you can predict whether or not that sequence of actions will lead to a grasp. Um, and so given, for example, one of these, these yellow actions, you can predict the binary event of grasping or not grasping. Um, and grasping is actually something that you could measure on the robot by looking at how wide the, whether or not after performing those actions, the robot was actually holding something. Um, another example is uh, if you care about collision avoidance, you can predict, given a sequence of actions, will I collide? Will I hit an object? And so if you have a sensor that can measure whether or not you've collided, then this is something that you can predict relatively easily. Uh, and then you can also predict um, things like, in a video game, your health your, or your damage or, or other uh, information about the environment. Uh, so this is something that's very nice if you don't want to, in these settings, you don't have to generate images. Um, this also has a very close connection to Q-learning because if you're predicting these types of events that will happen, if they were happen in the future, then you're essentially uh, trying to predict the probability of some event happening, which um, may correspond to your reward function if you care about whether or not that event happens. Okay, so the benefits of this approach in general is that you can only it allows you to only predict the task relevant quantities. Uh, and if you're in a multitask setting, you could predict the things that, that are relevant for different tasks. Uh, the downside is that you need to be able to observe those quantities, uh, which isn't true in the general case. You don't always know, for example, where objects are, or maybe if you are in a dialogue setting, you don't know the sentiment of the other person automatically. You don't observe that automatically. Um, and of course, you also need to manually pick these quantities that you think might be relevant to your task. Okay, cool. So that was all I had on model-based RL with image observations. Um, let's see. We have eight minutes. I think we have time to cover the, the last part rather than moving into next week. Are there any questions on this before I move on? Okay. So what about model-based meta-RL? Um, in some sense, we've already been doing some form of meta-RL. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a second. So we talked a bit before about how in many situations we have this dynamics model that doesn't vary across tasks. Uh, and in these cases, estimating the model is a single task problem. Um, but what if, we, what if the dynamics are actually changing across tasks? Um, and so for example, uh, if you're interacting with objects and you see an object on the table and you don't know kind of a priori how that object is going to move, if you just see an image of that object, you don't know the center of mass of the object, you don't know the friction, and so you don't necessarily know how it will actually move until you start interacting with it. Uh, in, in that context, it's actually somewhat of a partially observed problem and you need to actually adapt your model based off of a small amount of data in order to accurately predict how that object will move. Um, and so you can essentially view, if the dynamics are changing across tasks, you can actually turn mod the model learning problem from a supervised learning problem into a meta-learning problem, where you're now gonna be conditioning your model on some data, and then using that data to learn a better model. Uh, in this context, any of the kind of meta-learning approaches that we talked about before could be applied to this context. Um, so, for example, one meta-learning approach that we talked about before is using things like LSTMs or models with memory. Uh, and we were actually already using LSTMs to, and, and recurrent models to make predictions before. So the, those vision-based models, they were, um, you can essentially view them uh, in this way, in, in a sense, as a meta-learning problem because they're taking in the context of the past uh, few frames and predicting into the future. Uh, so, there's this somewhat of a blurred line between what is what constitutes a single model and what constitutes uh, like a meta-learned model. Okay, so one thing you could do is simply kind of collect data. Uh, if you want to turn this into a meta-learning problem, you can collect data in different environments and adapt your model to an environment given a small amount of data. Um, and you can actually also do this in a more online fashion. So say you have some robot that's uh, interacting in the environment and uh, has these different, different parts of the environment have different dynamics, such as a terrain change or a motor malfunction that causes the dynamics to change. Now, one of the things that you can do is you can kind of 
flatten out the, um, the experience of the robot uh, and view these different uh, changes in dynamics as happening at different points in time. And then if you take, it, uh, if you take this viewpoint, you can essentially view uh, the, the few shot learning problem uh, or kind of the meta learning problem as one of taking a slice, taking a window of time and using that slice of data to predict what will happen in the following slice of data. Um, so you can essentially view this problem of adapting your model or adapting to your environment online as a few shot learning problem where different tasks correspond to different slices of experience. Uh, where basically for, um, if you have k time steps of experience, this might correspond to the training data set for one task and the following k time steps or, or n time steps may correspond to the corresponding test set for that task. And then you can, this is one window of experience, you can kind of continuously slide that window to get different tasks, assuming you have some sort of temporal continuity in the dynamics that you're encountering. Okay, so you can use this, you can basically use your favorite meta learning method uh, to solve this kind of problem. Uh, and so what this might look like is that you have your last k time steps of experience, you then adapt your model using uh, your training data set and your prior uh, to learn a model that's specifically adapted to those k points in time, and then use that model to actually take actions and to, to plan using MPC. Uh, and so for example, this update rule may correspond to one step of gradient descent, and theta star may correspond to the initialization if you're using an algorithm like MAML. Uh, and so the way that this works is you may um, kind of collect data on different terrains, uh, such as the terrains shown here. This is a, a little six-legged robot called the Velociroach, and the dynamics of the robot actually vary drastically across different terrains and across different battery levels. And then you can train it to be able to uh, estimate dynamics with only k time steps experience, where k is something like eight time steps. And that in practice corresponds to actually less than a second of experience if you're at around like 10 to 20 hertz. And then evaluate the robot's ability to adapt to other types of dynamics, like being on a slope or missing a leg or having a payload uh, or having calibration errors. Um, and so what you can see is that if you try to put the robot on a narrow slope, so here's a, a visual of the slope up close. If you try to learn a single model uh, across these settings, I, what the robot will do is it will uh, kind of diverge across, it won't be able to run in a straight line because it won't have learned an accurate model. Uh, whereas if you use meta learning and actually adapt online uh, with each window of experience to the current model and use that to plan and run in a straight line. Uh, and you could also do something like take off the front right leg of the robot uh, and see uh, if you try to fit a single model, it isn't able to model the dynamics of these different uh, situations. Whereas if you train it to quickly adapt and then use, do that adaptation at uh, test time, then you can effectively follow a straight line. And so this is actually getting back to one of the questions at the beginning of the lecture, where you're not only using the observed state to replan, but you're also using the observed state to update your model at every single time step. Okay, cool. So I think that we're basically out of time. Um, some takeaways for, for model-based versus model-free learning. So some of the benefits of model-based learning is that it's very easy to collect data in a scalable way uh, without rewards. Um, it's pretty easy to transfer across different reward functions because it, that model only depends on uh, the data it was trained on and it has a less direct relationship on the reward than the policy. Um, and it also typically requires a smaller um, amount of data or at least a smaller amount of data that's supervised based on the reward. Um, the downsides of models is that they don't optimize for task performance and so there may be a mismatch in the, the, the objective you're optimizing for and the objective that you might care about. We saw the same thing in the representation learning setting if we're trying to learn a representation for reconstruction versus for the tasks that we care about. Um, and sometimes it's also harder to learn the model than to learn the policy, such as in the pouring example where you have, have to model fluid dynamics. Um, and then sometimes you may also need assumptions to learn complex skills, uh, such as the spatula example. And then for model-free methods, uh, the benefits is that it makes very little assumptions beyond a reward function. Uh, it's very effective for learning uh, complex policies. Uh, and learning complex skills. Uh, the downsides is that it requires a lot of experience and can be slower to learn. 
Um, and in the multitask learning setting in particular, it's a harder optimization problem because you have to learn a policy to perform all of the tasks uh, rather than just learning a model and inverting that model for an individual task, for each individual task you have at test time. Uh, and then I guess the last thing is that I don't think we necessarily have this dichotomy. I think that ultimately we probably want elements of both, such that when we're pouring water, we use a model-free approach, and such that when we're uh, maybe pushing objects around, we have a more model-based approach. Okay, um, in the next few weeks, uh, we'll be talking about kind of, this is, I guess, some, the conclusion of some of the RL section of the course, and uh, on Monday next week, we'll be talking about what about seeing tasks in sequence. Um, and we'll cover this both in the supervised setting and in the reinforcement learning setting. Um, on Wednesday, we'll be have paper presentations on some miscellaneous topics that are, are interesting with relating to task interference, differentiability, uh, sim to real methods, and hybrid reinforcement learning methods. Uh, and then the following three lectures will be about really the current frontiers of these approaches. So we'll have a guest lecture from Jeff Kloon, who works on evolutionary methods, lifelong learning, and meta-learning. I will have a guest lecture from Sergey Levin on information theoretic exploration approaches and how that can be used for task agnostic reinforcement learning. And uh, on Monday, of uh, a couple weeks after Thanksgiving, I'll be giving some perspectives on some challenges and, and frontiers of these topics. Uh, and then just a couple reminders, homework three is due tonight and the project milestone is due next week. I'll see, yeah, question. Questions with, um, with regard to model versus model three. Yeah. For sim to real, I've actually seen both used. I've seen both model-based methods to try to learn a model that's robust to different um, different contexts, and then using that model um, to plan. I've also seen model-free approaches, and that we'll see. Uh, I think we'll see a model-free approach in the paper that's covered on on Wednesday, or on yeah on Wednesday next week. Yeah, so there are definitely very recent papers that have looked at meta-learning for SimDoReal, where you try to, instead of learning a robust model, you would try to learn an adaptable model, such that you can adapt to any possible simulator, and then at test time, you're given the real world, and you want to be able to adapt to the real world. Um, there's at least one paper that came out in the last, like, two months that studied meta-learning for that problem. Um, so I think that's kind of at the cusp of, of where current research is at. Okay, great. See everyone on Monday.